Toronto. And uh, thank you. That's very nice of you. Uh, we had the incredible pleasure to be broadcasting from that spot right there this morning for three hours. And uh, it was amazing. One of the things that we do on our program is try and reflect this city as it looks right now. It looks a lot different now than it did two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. And this is a great example of that, an opportunity to be here to see a neighborhood in transition, to see a site in transition, to talk about the connection between the site and the neighborhood, and as we discussed several times this morning, to address head-on the issue of stigma when it comes to mental illness and mental health. It was a real pleasure to be there, and it's a real pleasure to be here this morning to welcome you to the grand opening of the uh, amazing buildings that you've seen around you, officially known as the Queen Street Redevelopment Project Phase 2. Thank you so much. Um, now the benefit of a day like today is that it's not raining. The downside of a day like today is that it is diabolically hot. So if you find, um, and we're going to keep things moving fairly quickly so that you're not in the heat for a long, long time, but if you find that you do need a bit of a break from the heat, the buildings around are air conditioned, there are tents, uh, there's water available as well, uh, some apple slices. Just take care of yourself because um, hydration is key in weather like this. We have an extraordinary group of uh, guests with us on stage and we're going to be speaking with those guests. It's kind of like radio on a stage over the course of the next hour. So I'm going to introduce them and I will ask our esteemed guests if you will raise your hand as I introduce you. The President and CEO of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, Dr. Catherine Zahn. Deb Matthews, the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Dr. Eric Hoskins, the Minister of Children and Youth Services. We have a couple of uh, clients of uh, CAMH with us as well. Uh, you heard him this morning on Metro Morning, Nick Carveth. The author, John Bentley Mays. As well, we have with us Toronto City Councilor Mike Layton. MVP, Shaded from the Sun, Rosario Marchese. The Chief Executive Officer of Bell Canada, George Cope. As well, we have Aboriginal Elder Elita Sauve. It is a, a tradition for CAMH to begin ceremonies like this with an Aboriginal blessing. And on a day like today in this weather, it's actually even more appropriate. Today is uh, National Aboriginal Day, a day that this entire country celebrates the incredible achievements of our Aboriginal First Nations and Métis peoples. We're delighted to have uh, Elisa Sauvé, a young elder associated with the Haida Medicine Society here to perform a blessing with hand drumming. Elisa is a woman of two nations, Talha and Cree. She's employed as a supervisor of a team addressing mental health and addiction issues with the Native Child and Family Services of Toronto, an incredible organization here in this city. She's a colleague as well of CAMH's elder Vern Harper. Please, if we would, Lisa, please. That's my mother's language. My mother's name is Husle. She's a Taltan woman. And uh, I'm going to uh, say some words to creation in my language and quickly translate them for you uh, right afterwards. Denethotia, denotia, denethotia, tsu. Beautiful Creator, we want to thank you for our lives today. We want to say thank you to you, Mother Earth, and all of your relations, and all of our relations on Mother Earth in the four directions for this life today. We want to say this morning, thank you to Grandfather Sun and Grandmother Moon and Father Sky for your blessings. We want to say to you, Denotia, beautiful creator of God, thank you for everything that you provide for us. We ask that, that you bless this place and the work that is done here. And we say, may do, may do, may do all my relations. Oh, hey, 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 oh,
to join us on Metro Morning. She has been the president and CEO of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health since December of 2009. She's a neurologist, an academic leader, an innovator in the world of healthcare, as somebody who is moving CAMH and the field of mental illness and addiction forward, trying to deal with that issue of stigma, trying to deal with that issue of neighborhoods and normalization, again, something that we spoke about extensively this morning. Please welcome, if you would, the president and CEO of CAMH, Dr. Catherine Zahn. Good morning and welcome everyone to our uh, grand opening. 
Welcome to all 600 plus of you. Uh, the audience includes our neighbors, our uh, friends and family, our uh, staff, and, and our patients. People have, who are all so incredibly intrinsic to the work that we have to do, the work that we've already done, and the future of, uh, of uh, mental health in our society. I actually have a very simple job this morning, and it's just to say the thank yous. Uh, I want to say thank you to those who created this vision, those who had the courage and the conviction to bring it forward. So first of all, thank you, of course, to my predecessor, Paul Garfinkel, and the team of architects. The team of architects, Community Care Consortium, or C4, as we called them, composed of four firms, Kuobara, Payne, McKenna, Bloomberg Architects, Montgomery Sizem Architects, Kern Mancini Architects, and Canon. Thank you so much for uh, creating this vision for us. <laughs> to the Ontario government for believing in CAMH and for giving the mental health of Ontarians the priority that it deserves. You're leading the way in fighting against the prejudice and the discrimination. And you're leading the way in building a system of care in which no one is left behind. Thank you so much. Thank you to our foundation, our donors, to our volunteer campaign co-chairs, Jamie Anderson, Michael McCain, and Tom Milroy. The Transforming Lives campaign raised an inspiring $108 million, much in support of this redevelopment. You've supported us along this path of hope, you've put your faith in our vision, and in fact you've courageously attached your names to this cause. Thank you very much. I want to thank our neighbors, our local neighbors, for joining with us to transform this incredible neighborhood and for helping us to break down the walls, both physical and metaphorical, ideological, that kept us separate in the past. Thank you all so very much. <laughs> to Carillion, our building partner and their architect, Stantec, and last, but really first in my mind to our staff, especially our redevelopment office led by Dev Chopra and David Kunick, who've been living and breathing this project day by day since its inception. Thank you very much. Well, we think of this project as our true transformation. It uh, stands as a symbol of our cause. It stands as a symbol of the hope that, uh, that transcends the future of, of health in this province. These new facilities are that physical representation of uh, dignity and inclusion, and we believe that our property plays a part in the recovery of the people that we serve. It reflects the dynamism of our exciting neighborhood, and it contributes to the stature of our fantastic city. We're keeping hope alive on our campus, and through this wonderful investment in our facilities, we're saying to our patients, we'll never give up on you. Today, CAMH turns a page in history with the official opening of these buildings and the launch of our new strategic plan. We're promising through this organization, with the help of everybody here, a future where no one believes that their life is not worth living. Thank you very much for coming to celebrate with us today. Thank you very much, Patrick. And we want to get into that now in a series of conversations with people who have played instrumental roles in this, but also in there since 2009. And last year, she launched Ontario's comprehensive mental health and addiction strategy with a focus on identifying mental health and addiction problems early in life. Joining Deb Matthews will be Dr. Eric Hoskins, family physician and MPP for the Toronto Riding of St. Paul's. He was appointed Minister of Children and Youth Services in October of 2011. He has a special interest in youth mental health, and his ministry is actively involved in that provincial strategy. Please welcome, if you would, Deb Matthews and Eric Hoskins. Well, how serious of an issue in this province is mental health and addiction? Um, Deb, we can start with you. Well, there's no question. It's a very serious problem. One in five of us are affected by mental illness or addictions, and 
would venture to say that uh, there is no family that is not impacted. And so it's, this is all of us. But what's really exciting now is that the stigma cut is coming down and our, um, our determination to actually get people who need help the help they need when they need it is growing. I, I think there's extraordinary leadership here at CAMH. Uh, I want to say thanks to Matt this morning. Metro Morning went a long, long way to that stigma busting um, that so needs to happen. I, um, I just want to share a little story, if you don't mind, sure. I'll, I'll make it fast. A very, very dear friend of mine has a son who was diagnosed with a mental illness. And she said to me, you know, if my son was diagnosed with cancer, there would be a lineup of people bringing casseroles to my house. When my son was diagnosed with mental illness, my phone stopped ringing. And I think that speaks to the very deep stigma that is out there uh, right across society. Mental illness is still a mystery to a lot of us, and the more we can normalize mental health and uh, uh, addictions and mental health treatment, the better off we all will be. Eric, you have an interesting Bobby, perspective. I, uh, being a physician, I, I feel the need to sort of do a public service announcement as well, because I know how hot it is out there and how long a lot of you have been waiting. And so there's lots of shade at the back. So I'd really encourage uh, individuals who are feeling the uh, the weight of the heat this morning to uh, find a more comfortable position. We're blessed since I graduated from medical school in terms of how we view mental illness, in terms of the services uh, and supports that we're able to provide, uh, great uh, resources like we see here at CAMH. Uh, as Minister of Children and Youth Services, it's uh, incredible to understand that 70% uh, of mental illness in this province is actually diagnosed uh, in childhood or adolescence. And that, uh, and in fact, it's estimated that probably uh, one out of every five children and youth are uh, suffering from mental illness today. So it, it underscores, I think, for all of us, uh, including yourselves, the importance of uh, of, of early access to good programs, supportive programs, and and uh, particularly uh, uh, ensuring that we're able to diagnose early and provide the services that these young people need. Across Canada, the uh, statistics are pretty serious uh, when you look at issues like youth suicide, for example, where uh, it's the second leading cause of death after accidents for children, for individuals between the age of 10 and 25. Among First Nations, it's probably five or six times higher than it is for the national matter and move us as a society forward in terms of how we understand and treat mental illness. Yep. So I would say this is a wonderful new building, a new redevelopment that is just fantastic. But what is more important by a long shot is that it represents a complete transformation in how we treat mental illness. So these buildings uh, facilitate a change in how uh, mental illness is, uh, is, is treated and it's, you know, bringing the community in and bringing the, uh, the care out, it is so much a part of a major transformation. And CAMH is leading the world on this. This is a, not just an opening for us, this is important for the whole world. The world is watching this. So I see Dr. Garfinkel there and I just, what a champion, what a hero, and thank you so much. That matter and move us as a society forward in terms of how we understand and treat mental illness. Yep. So I would say this is a wonderful new building, a new redevelopment that is just fantastic. But what is more important by a long shot is that it represents a complete transformation in how we treat mental illness. So these buildings uh, facilitate a change in how uh, mental illness is, uh, is, is treated and it's, you know, bringing the community in and bringing the, uh, the care out, it is so much a part of a major transformation. And CAMH is leading the world on this. This is a, not just an opening for us, this is important for the whole world. The world is watching this. So I see Dr. Garfinkel there and I just, what a champion, what a hero, and thank you so much. Part of that, there's a child, youth, and family program which truly is groundbreaking that there's a uh, an inpatient facility to assist uh, youth that are uh, faced with a dual challenge of both addictions and mental health mental illness and and Deb is 
I think we're both so proud of the leadership demonstrated by CAMH and to and the, the aspect of the integration with the community which is so important and, and bi-directional as well it's to uh, obviously the supports that exist within uh, within our communities are so important for the wellness and for the healing of individuals that are uh, facing mental illness but also for our communities I think it's important for that awareness building because mental illness is part of all our lives it's part of our communities it's part of what we share one of the challenges that we all share as a human race it's part of our humanity and so to understand and to uh, to reinforce the idea that uh, that this these great facilities here uh, provide a tremendous service but they're also part of how it will dovetail nicely with the work that's happening here so it's all about providing the right care at the right time in the right place it's a real partnership between many ministries um, and many levels of government it's all about Identifying people early, we put in a big focus on children and youth because as Eric says, 70% of adult mental illness is actually identifiable in childhood and adolescence. So getting there earlier, getting the care in the community, working really hard to destigmatize and, and as Eric says, your know, mental health is mental illness is part of humanity. There is no society that does not have a significant number of people who face challenges. So you know, we're, we've been good at uh, destigmatizing things like cancer, uh, but now it's time to really de destigmatize uh, mental illness. It's just another part of the body, and for some reason it has become stigmatized. I think a big part of that is familiarity. And uh, so things like the Out of This World Cafe, where we've got people with mental illness, um, recovering from mental illness, dealing with mental illness, actually interacting with the public in a way that's non-threatening, that's friendly, that's good food. Uh, this is all, these are all steps we need to be embracing and celebrating. Well, and I think one of, perhaps one of the, for me at least, one of the most exciting things about what's happening here at CAMH is that, I mean, obviously, Deb and I have a great responsibility as does the government. We're proud of the work that we're undertaking, but it's not simply a government effort here. It's anything but. It's government plus, and so I'm so proud to see that George is here from Bell, and the, you know the name of Bell is on the building right behind us. As you go down University Ave, and looking at the hospitals, there are so many names and organizations that are on those buildings, but it's been a long time coming, yeah. quite frankly, where individuals. I was here two months ago when Margaret McCain, on behalf of the McCain Foundation, announced $10 million of funding from their foundation, a very generous gift to help specifically on child and youth mental health illnesses, uh, their name on a building as well. That, that It's that kind of advocacy. It's the pride that we should all feel to be working together to invest in finding solutions for these sorts of challenges, that that helps to break down the barriers, reduce and eventually eliminate the stigma that's so damaging. More on that to come, certainly, when we speak with uh, George Cope. In the meantime, thank you both for being here. Thanks, Matt. Steph Matthews and Eric Collins. In our little tiny studio over uh, at uh, the uh, Out of This World Cafe. Nick Carveth, when he was 18, was addicted to crack cocaine, had an undiagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder, as well as an anxiety disorder. This was so crippling that he couldn't leave the house unless he was high. He talked about becoming addicted to crack cocaine and how that was essentially allowing him to get through the uh, daily travails of his life. He felt hopeless and then found support through CAMH, and particular through the Child and Youth Family Program, transformed his life, graduated from the REACH High School Program, completed high school here at CAMH, and is now doing social work studies at Ryerson University. We thought it was important to get his perspective as a client alongside the perspective of John Bentley Mays, an award-winning critic, author, and teacher, one of Canada's most influential voices on contemporary art and culture. He is a columnist of the Globe and Mail. He himself has battled serious depression over the course of his career, captured in an extraordinary book called The Jaws of the Black Dogs, a memoir of depression. He is a CAMH client. He's a member as well of the Geriatric Programs Advisory Committee and somebody who understands the importance of what we were talking about the, this morning, the architecture of happiness and the architecture of health. Please welcome, if you would, John Bentley Mays and Nick Carmen. Thank you very much. Hi. Nice to see you. Um, Nick, we'll start with you. We heard about uh, your journey this morning on the program. For people who perhaps uh, did not hear, tell us a little bit about your involvement with CAMH, with this redevelopment, and, and how important, again, this facility was in you turning your life around. Sure. Um, 
Yeah, I, when I was in grade 12, I became heavily addicted to cocaine and uh, was removed from high school for that reason. I had a really hard time going to classes sober. Um, so I, I started in the, uh, in the REACH program at CAMH, which is recovery and education for adolescents choosing health. And uh, I was able to work on high school credits there. I graduated um, in the program. I spent two years there. And uh, I found it really quite the opposite of a lot of other treatment programs that I participated in that were more abstinence-based. Um, really, really passionate about the, uh, the fact that they have a harm reduction philosophy. Um, and I see it as much more, uh, much more accepting, much more supportive than abstinence and 12-step and, and, and those type of things. If you had not encountered CAMH and the services here, where do you think you'd be right now? Um, I don't know. I mean, it's possible that I would be on the street. Uh, when I was uh, removed from high school, the principal told my parents that, you know, that they should let me become hopeless, uh, homeless. And uh, if I survived, then maybe I would learn. Um, and, uh, you know, instead I went to CAMH and I was able to recover at home, but that's also another reason why I think that the, uh, the new youth beds are so important because a lot of my friends and a lot of the people I, I work with in, uh, in an agency that I volunteer for are street involved and I can only imagine how much more difficult that makes their uh, recovery from substances. John, for you, um, what was your uh, first contact with CAMH and how important was it? Well, my first contact with CAMH was because my doctor moved here from Sunnybrook and, uh, up until that point, um, my treatment had been for depression for many years, had been a matter of psychotherapy and then more likely drugs of one kind or another. And when I moved to CAMH about 10 or 12 years ago, I discovered the wide range of possibilities for treatment that I didn't know anything about. I'd never been much of a researcher. Yeah. And it was a great surprise to me to find out what kind of care was available. So what were some of the things that you were steered towards that perhaps, again, you had no idea even existed? I think uh, behavioral therapy was one thing that did help me a great deal and that, that I've appreciated. Um, I think that the intensification over the last few years of chemical therapy as opposed to talk therapy has been a major turning point for me in the way I understand what treatment can be. And one of the emphases that I appreciate about this hospital is that it's so oriented towards that kind of practical intervention by the use of drugs and by new electrical treatments, by electroshock, which I've had, and uh, uh, also by uh, even newer kind of therapies that are just coming on stream. Nick mentioned uh, the 12 beds that are opening up in that building right there. You've been involved uh, in helping to shape what the site would look like and the needs that perhaps clients would see addressed. Tell us a little bit about what you believe clients are looking for in a site like this. Well, I think that I've looked for three things since I've been associated with this hospital. In the first place, as the outpatient, I've looked for a kind of care that would enable me to go on functioning in the world as best I could. And I found that here. Um, on two occasions, I've been very severely depressed in a way that I couldn't handle on my own or that my family couldn't handle in me. And I've ended up as an inpatient here. I feel that CAMH in its old form uh, in the 1950s building where the geriatric unit was located was a good place. It was, there was nothing wrong with it. The staff was wonderful. It was, a, it was a good place, but still a rather bare bones and an interesting place. This facility, I feel, will be much more of a place where people can feel at home when they have to come into the hospital for the reason. And my third relationship with this is as a writer, because I've written an article uh, for Canadian Architect Magazine about the redevelopment, trying to evaluate its various architectural dimensions and, uh, and the way it's being proceeded with. And just the most conspicuous part of this redevelopment is the way that it orients mental health care away from the old asylum model into a new model of community integration. Now, in recent years, uh, my doctors may not be too happy to hear me say this, but in recent years, the asylum has become demonized but in a lot of circles. But to my mind, it did provide one thing that was valuable, and that was a sense of a place to go for people who didn't fit in in the larger society, a place, to, a refuge, in other words. 
But this is a very different kind of model from that. This is more of a community center model where the buildings are integrated into the street grid by, by streets which already exist, so the existing street grid penetrates the site, and so it's not separate from the city. Eventually I understand that this will be a place where there will be uh, different kinds of retail outlets to normalize its, its architectural relationship with the city. And this to me is a very stirring development and a very interesting experiment, and I look forward to seeing how it turns out. I'm really thrilled to be here. We're delighted that you are here. Gentlemen, thank you. Thanks very much. Mr. Carver and Joan Bentley Mays. For years now, I'm the only one here taking care of you. You know what, Mom? I, I just need to get to class. You know how my teachers are. Can you please, please just take your medication? Please, Mom. I told you I'm not going back. What do you mean you're not going back? <coughs> Have you been smoking in here again? Nah, it's just incense. <laughs> so you're smoking incense now? <laughs> Why you must think I'm a damn fool? By the way, have you even found that job yet? Who's gonna hire me? You don't help me with no rent, no bills, or no groceries. Do me a favor. Get out of my room. Get out of my room or else. Or else what? <laughs> yes, I can do that. <laughs> that was Jerome. I know, I know. I've only known him for three days, but when I'm with him, I don't feel depressed. I hide behind the sex, just like I did with every other ex. It's the way I hide my depression. And he doesn't even know I have an infection. My spirit's broken. It's in a recession. I'm waiting for my bailout. When Melanie sees her mom, she sees herself. Afraid that she'll turn into her and become somebody else. It's called schizophrenia, but that doesn't have to be Melanie's fate. But if she doesn't take care of her mind, the disease will lurk at her gate. Take care of the mind, so simple yet hard. It's the only way to keep your sanity without leaving your mind scarred. He struggles with his mother's past. Puff, puff, pass. There's nobody around him, nobody to turn to. A path full of burning charcoal for him to walk through. His anxiety and post-traumatic stress consume him, but his marijuana soothes him. Family and friends stranded him. He tries to reach the sky, but the pain force landed him. He tells himself he doesn't need any help because he thinks he can cure himself. Diana used to be free, full of joy, not beat up and used by trouble boys. She doesn't know who she is anymore. The old D who believed and loved herself is dead. She's just a shell, burning in her own soul, crushing hell. Her unhealed pain keeps her in her prison. And she has a deadly obsession, thinking sex and men will heal her depression. More than 80% of youth with a mental health issue will receive no help. We need access to preventative, youth-friendly, and culturally sensitive services within our communities. Here is a fact that you cannot hide. 4,000 Canadians die each year from suicide. They don't really care about us. Yeah! They don't really care about us. Yeah! All I want to say is that they don't really care about us. All I want to say is that they don't really care about us. All I want to say is that, all I want to say is that, all I want to say is that they don't really care about us. The number of people living with a mental illness will double. If we don't continue to promote mental health and well-being, we will all be in serious trouble.
philanthropic perspective as well. And what happens when somebody makes a statement, we spoke this morning with Michael McCain about this, about people uh, making a statement in terms of a gesture, in terms of putting a name on something where people have been in the past afraid to put a name on something. George Cope is the president and CEO of Bell Canada and BCE Incorporated. In 2010, as you well know, Bell launched the Bell Let's Talk initiative. This was a five-year, $50 million program to get people talking about mental illness. No small matter, no small check either. As part of this initiative in 2011, Bell donated $10 million to the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, the largest corporate donation to mental illness in Canada, naming the Bell Gateway Building behind us. As a result, Bell received the 2011 AFP Greater Toronto Chapter Philanthropy Award for Outstanding Corporation. Wanted to welcome to the stage, if you would, the President and CEO of Bell Canada, George Cole. Thank you. Well, I think, uh, first of all, let me just start before I directly answer the question and congratulate everyone here today. This is absolutely an unbelievable day in, in Ontario and in Canada. I think it's just incredible. So the people here deserve just an incredible round of applause from CAMH. I think it's you know, why, why is Bell involved with, with this initiative? Well, you know, we've been involved, as people would know, here in the community for over 130 years. But the reality was when we look back three or four years ago and we looked across the country, so this is a national program, there was one area where really no corporation had said that's where 100% of their focus would be. This, this room knows enough, this group knows enough about the numbers, but it was very clear from our view that with our brand and our history, if we could put our brand as part of this story, we could help tear these walls down around this issue, which is there can be no illness in Canada, none, that has a stigma attached to it. And to me, that's what today's about. And for Bell, I've not been president in all 130 years, that would be obvious, but I don't know if there's ever been a prouder, prouder day for Bell Canada than having its company's name go on a building associated with this illness. So it's an enormously important day for all the Bell team members. Uh, attached to a building at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. Uh, what difference do you think this has made and what sort of reaction have you received to that gesture, to taking that leadership role? The, the reaction's been uh, actually overwhelming. I mean, Corporate Canada has, has joined us, they're supportive. I mean, I'll give a couple very specific examples where it's just changed. We wanted to launch the Let's Talk program. We called the leadership over at CBC. And of course, we're CTV. It took them five minutes to say, yes, we'll get Clara Hughes on Hockey Night in Canada. Our friends we compete with in Rogers, it took them five minutes to say, we'll take our name down and put Bell Let's Talk name up at every hockey game over the next four weeks. So I think it's broken the barriers between corporations because we all understand that it's an issue. And then the other key area for corporate Canada is this illness Good has girl. very specific Good recovery girl. methods that are different yeah, than others. Nice and we're lady. working very hard to now Where's put in place name? standards and with a number of organizations so that when people come back into the workplace, there's a stream that recognizes this is a little different than some other illnesses. And that, if we do anything else at Bell and across corporate Canada, I think we'll have made our contribution as well towards what is a, you know, a significant issue that we all know the numbers affects everyone. These are extraordinary buildings. We had, as I mentioned, the great pleasure this morning to broadcast from the Bell Gateway building. Seeing this go up must have been remarkable, but having that opportunity to see the doors open and people are going to have the chance to go and, and make their way through the building um, must really say something about how this city has changed when it comes to issues of mental health and mental illness and how we as a society can keep moving forward. What can this building behind us do to contribute to that, do you think? Well, I think I think Cam H is really the who should be recognized today for what's happened in Toronto, and as an organization, Bell has this program nationally. There are other regions of the country that we're really trying to work into. In some senses, follow the leadership of Cam H, the leadership of Jamie Anderson, Michael Wilson, and the previous folks who really put this together. And in some senses, Bell's just following what people have done. The one challenge I would put is this is the only mental health building in Canada with a company name on it. 
that's not acceptable. And so if you were that has to change after this morning, and I'm going to call on the business leadership to step up and do their part that way with every other mental health facility in the country. So if you're speaking to that business leadership, what would you say specifically to this morning? Well, you know what I would say to the business leadership, and people have embraced it. So it's not a, it's it's in one sense, it's no criticism. It's an opportunity, and I think people now are saying, you know, you know, CEO, Bell Canada, BC. Pleasure to have you here. One of the really interesting the parts counselor for Ward 19, a very active friend to CAMH as part of the community. Rosario, of course, MPP for Trinity Spadina, and he's been involved right from the very beginning. Gentlemen, good morning to you. Hi there, Matt. Nice to have you here. To be here. Keeping cool. <laughs> the cloud just here come the cloud cover. And uh, thanks for staying. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate your patience as well. Um, Talk a little bit, if you would, Rosario, about the importance of knitting together these various neighborhoods and how uh, you create that sense of a, a two-way conversation, a three-way, four-way conversation between this site and all of the areas around it. Well, I, I think it started uh, uh, a long time ago, and I want to say that I was here organizing with Stan Repka in 1980, and Stan Repka is still very, very connected to, to this place. So we, we've had that relationship uh, with this site for a, for a long, long time. And, I, and I, what I want to say about this is that we have changed the connection to the community by changing the architecture of this place. And it's an architecture of inclusion versus the old architecture of exclusion. And so not only have we changed the architecture, but we've changed the culture. And we've made that connection with the people that live in this community and have evolved with the development of what has happened here. And much of that, uh, uh, much of the uh, uh, honor goes to, to uh, the, not just Catherine now, but people like Park Gonfrenko and, and people that were connected with him to make sure that they reached out to not just the politicians like myself and Joe Pantaloni of the old days, but to the community. And as a result of those communications and connections, we have this. Congratulations. Are essential. Well, I think there's two types of connections that we're talking about here. One is that sense of community, that connection between people. And then there's the addition of, of the neighborhood connection, that, that, that community connection to place. Uh, and I think that that's something that it, it, it takes care and attention to detail when doing that. And when in a project of this size, careful planning. And, and I commend the, the, the folks that did the planning for the site because uh, not only did they get the built form connections right, but over time what developed was this stronger community connection uh, with the redevelopment of the site through uh, through the community liaison committee. And that, that was a relationship and a trust that developed over time, uh, which really was bringing the community into this space and understanding it better, understanding its use, understanding the, the, the clients, understanding the staff, and then figuring out a way for it to knit in better with the with the neighborhood um, outside of the site. And I think you can see, even as you just look up Ossington here, one of the, the, the city's most dynamic streets, a, a, a street being, uh, being changed and, and going through its own transformation, and now you can see it from the site, and it's it, the site is much more open to, to the surrounding community. How do we ensure that you don't just see it from the site, but that um, everybody here feels welcome on this side of the street and on that side of the street? And it, it, it's it's a large question, but it's an important question to deal with. Um, we spoke about this this morning from the client perspective to ensure that that it's not just community with a big C up in the sky, but actually something that really means something to everybody who's involved in this. Rosario. I think I think the way it's structured, it allows people in the community to walk through it and realize that this is a place that is for everyone. It isn't just for those who suffer mental illness and addiction, but but for everybody. And so, uh, physically, the way it's structured allows people to to realize or to feel that it's a normal place. And that's the effect that I think uh, the the uh, the people who construct this way wanted to uh, wanted to create. And when we realize that so many people are suffering from mental illness and that one of us may be affected uh, one day or the other, and when we have eminent people, which is the leadership again of, the, of Cam H and Paul Garfinkel of the days, to, to get eminent people to start talking about mental illness. And that indeed it affects everybody at the various levels of social strata. And when that happens, then that becomes normal to everybody. But the way it's structured here, it allows everybody in this community and beyond to feel that it belongs to everyone and not just those who come to be helped by, by cabbage. Sites too expensive, we can't do city building. How do you see this as, as a project of, of city building? 
Well, I think part of it is the process. It's that conversation that you have with the, with the community and, and, and those involved. And it, and it started many, many years ago, well before my time started with my predecessor, uh, Joe Pantaloni and, and Rosario and, and, and folks in the, uh, that, that are here today. Uh, and it was a discussion about the city that we want to live in and, and the inclusiveness that we want to include in that. Uh, and and, and the, the walls that we want to break down so that people feel more comfortable and more hopeful and more optimistic in the community that they live in. And, and I think it's that conversation that then once you actually get the plans and the maps put on you can start uh, that, that conversation turns into a, into a reality uh, and it's, it's, it's it was it was exciting to, to come on at the later stages uh, just just to see the the, the end product uh, because uh, often the city building conversations take a long time uh, the 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 building plans are, are one thing, and we, we often hear complaints that are that it, that it takes a long time once the, the idea is uh, is put on paper to get it built. But when you're talking about city building, there's another layer to that, right. and that's looking at at larger sites. And so it was very exciting to see uh, the end product of that process. One of the most interesting comments I heard this morning from one of our guests was, um, she said. In, in the context of all of this being normalized and this is a normal neighborhood, she said, this is Toronto. And that, to me, said a lot about the city, yes, that we want to live in, but the city that we live in as well. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Layton, Rosario Marquesi. And now, it's time. You have been exceptionally patient in wilting, and then you will have the opportunity to make your way through these buildings. Um, there could be long lines. We want to ensure that uh, you get some hydration, perhaps something you'd eat as well. So there's food that's scattered around. The tours are going to leave about every 10 minutes or so. Uh, I've spent uh, the last week or so going through these buildings for uh, the purpose of uh, our show today. And I have to tell you that some of them, and some of the spaces are um, incredible, just in terms of rethinking the difference between old and new and allowing you to kind of position your mind for what is possible on a site like this. So get some food, stretch your legs, get a drink after the ribbon cutting and then make your way through the tours. Head for the white umbrellas and the purple uh, and white umbrellas that will direct you to the tours. And as I say, they'll leave every time. Catherine and Depp will do the slicing for us. We're gonna ask you to count down to the cutting if we would. Get right in there. Audience participation will count from five. Ready? Almost. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Slice away. Keep going. More to cut. With the ribbon cut, I now declare the three buildings of the second phase of CAMH's Queen Street Redevelopment Project officially open. <laughs>